Hi everyone, uh, thanks thanks very much for uh, coming along to Roomcast Uptime 2020. I know everybody's kind of, you know, everyone's a little bit whacked out on online events and webinars and everything else that's pulling us away from our work. Um, and everyone's super busy at the moment, so I really do appreciate you taking the time. I'm going to talk a little bit about, as you can imagine, uh, based on what we've got on screen here, the latest updates to Roomcast Analyzer. I did kind of start this off as a, oh, let's just check my clicker doesn't seem to want to, want to play there. Let's try that one again. There we go. Yeah. So we, we advertised this as redacted because there was a whole bunch of stuff that I'm going to be talking about today that, um, that, that we weren't able to talk about until right now. Um, so all of the stuff that, you, that, that I'm going to be speaking about, apart from the stuff right at the very end, that's all available within Runcast Analyzer right now. So if you've got Runcast Analyzer in your environment, all you have to do is just you know update. If you've got automatic updates, you're probably going to find that by the time this session's over, you've already got this functionality there. So yeah, thanks very much for the time. I did just want to kind of postpone the beginning of this session by a couple of minutes because in the UK we observe a two minute silence today. So for those of you who don't know me, um, this chap is me. I'm a senior systems engineer at Runcast, and I deal with all kinds of stuff. I mean, for a lot of people, uh, a systems engineer is basically a technical salesperson, and I guess that's part of my role. But my, the, the 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 thing that I see as most important to my role is is really connecting with uh, with our customers, with our partners, and making sure that they're using Runcast to the best of their abilities. And any ideas that they might have, I get to feed back into our engineering team so that we can make the product even better for you. So thank you for everyone who's already had conversations with me. If anyone has any other uh, questions about the product or you know any ideas as to where we can go from here, uh, please do hit me up either now or after the event. Uh, you can see down at the bottom there, um, you can get me on Twitter. Um, I'm at Kev underscore Johnson. Um, I also help run a podcast called Open Techcast. And I have a very, very rarely updated blog, which I don't think I've touched since about February. So I should probably update those at some point soon as well. But yeah, please hit me up. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, we do have a chat section in here, um, and there's also a Q&A um, section. So if you want to submit questions in the Q&A or just submit them in the chat, um, I'll try to get through, get to them as we go through the session. Um, alternatively, you know, if we get if we get all the way to the end and we've still got time, and you know, fingers crossed, we will still have a little bit of time, then I'll address them at that point. So yeah, that's me. Anyway, that's that's probably the least important thing. So. I'm, I'm seeing some of the names that are here, you know, you're aware of Runecast. I, I, mean, if I, know, I know some of you are customers of Runecast, some of you are using the product um, all the time. And, you know, you're, you're those people who give us great feedback. But for the benefit of those who aren't 100% aware of what we do, I'm just going to run through a very, very quick introduction. So the chaps that you see on the screen here, these are the, these are the folks that founded Runecast. Um, they all used to work together at IBM in the Center of Excellence in Berno in the Czech Republic. And they used to basically run IBM's uh, managed VMware environments. So they had many, many, many customers. Um, all of them were running VMware environments. And occasionally, as you would imagine, uh, you know, th th there, was, there, were, there would be problems would come up. And when these problems happened, they had to investigate, they had to do root cause analysis and discover you know, what caused these problems. And then once you determine what's caused those problems, you then have to check all of the other customer environments against these exact same symptoms. So, you know, in many cases, we're looking at things like bad drivers or a patch that's gone awry or a patch that's missing. And the thing that they discovered when they, while they were all working together, is that 90% of issues that were, you know, that were causing, you know, that were being rolled up to them were caused by known issues. So they're documented somewhere. It's really, you, you should be able to avoid these particular lumps in the road, but unfortunately nobody reads that documentation until they get hit with a problem. So they came up with this idea, why can't we take all of these sources of data and you know, there, there's massive amounts of data out there just to, just to put some, some ideas out there. Uh, the VMware knowledge base alone um, has over 28,000 articles published in the English language. 28,000, nobody is gonna read all of those. In fact, realistically, nobody is gonna read any of them until they get the problems. So why can't you take all of that data, convert it from um, you know, human readable data into machine readable rules. And then once you've got them in, in, in that format, you can actually, you know, you can apply some logic, you can scan your environments and see, you know, if you have any exposure to any of these issues. And then if you do have the exposure, we're going to show you what you need to do in order to rectify these situations. 
So in terms of what Runecast Analyzer is, and you know, again, a lot of you are probably aware of, of, of what we are, what we do, um, but there's two real parts to this. On the left-hand side here, we've got the artificial intelligence assisted knowledge parser. And we say assisted uh, because you know, it, it, it is an AI, it does all of this parsing knowledge, but we still have human beings that, that kind of deal with the output from that AI to, to make sure it's all, um, it's all relevant, it's, there's no false positives or anything like that. Uh, so what happens is this AI, it, it scans all of these various different sources of data, the VMware knowledge base, all these best practices, Kubernetes best practices, we launched Kubernetes support recently. Uh, you'll be able to see over on the right hand side, we can analyze Kubernetes clusters wherever they run. Um, we, we've got all of these different security standards. So if you've got to be compliant with things like PCI DSS or HIPAA or CIS, we can really help to automate the reporting process for you. So you can see what your exposure to any, any non-compliances is, and also to see what your exposure to risks are. And you know, various different vendor guidelines. So things like pure storage, if you've got pure storage in your environment, we'll automatically detect it and we'll provide you with those best practices checks. SAP HANA, again, same thing. We can provide these best practices checks to make sure that you're running in line with these vendor guidelines. So we pull all of this data down. It goes, in, goes into this Wooncast central repository, which is um, basically, for, to all intents and purposes, it's a web server. And um, this is where we serve the updates from. So these updates can be pulled down by your Wooncast analyzer appliance, which runs on premises. Uh, and you know that can either happen automatically if you've got a connection out from the appliance to the internet. In fact, a one specific URL on the internet, so you can really lock that down through your proxy. Um, or alternatively, if you're working in a more secure, you know, you know more rigorously secured environment, um, you might need to do offline updates. So you can also go to the Runecast customer portal, download those updates, and you know you can run whatever scans you might need to do. You probably need to do antivirus scans or something like that on there. Once you're happy that there's nothing malicious in those updates, you can then apply them to the appliance that runs on premises. And the appliance is really, the, the, that's, that's where all the goodness happens. So the appliance is where the scans are done. There's no data sent back out to the cloud or anything like that. So everything happens on appliance. It's a super lightweight appliance. It takes about five minutes to deploy, about another five minutes to configure. And you can have actionable data out of there between, in between kind of 10, 15 minutes. So, you know, if you've not tried Runecast Analyzer yet, please do hit, hit us up. I think I've got a slide at the end that will show you how you can get hold of a free 14 day trial. But you point the Runecast Analyzer appliance at uh, your vCenter servers. So we can, we can manage many, many vCenter servers, we, your NSX managers, your Horizon Connection servers, all of these different sources of data. And now things like Kubernetes and also the AWS native public cloud. And if you're running VMware Cloud on AWS, Great. As far as we're concerned, it's just another vCenter to analyze. And so we can provide you with all of these knowledge base articles, all of the best practices, all of that goodness. So um, just a few key points. It deploys, it's, as I said, it's an OBA file. It's, um, so it, when you download it, it's about 1.3 something gig. So it takes next to no time to download. Um, deploy and configure, I think I've covered all of this stuff anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 The, Again, that, that bottom one is really important for some of our customers. For some of our customers, it's absolutely not. You know, we do have we do have customers who are um, you know they're leveraging services like VMware Skyline, and you know that this is cool, and and they they still want to use Runecast Analyzer because we take the idea of Skyline and we really build on. Excuse me, we really build on that. We extend the capabilities of Skyline into your data center, giving you all of the all of this extra data uh, and all of these extra findings for you. And this is the slide that I keep meaning to hide from this deck, but I always forget. Um, so yeah, 90% of issues documented already, but you only read that documentation reactively. Be more proactive about your environment. And that's basically what we're here to do. So one of the things I wanted to, uh, to cover off today is I'm, I'm here to talk about what's, what's just been released with Runecast Analyzer. But at the same time, you know, I, wa I wanna really go through what we've actually brought to the market in, in the time that I've been with the company. So I joined the company in February this year. And, you know, we've been, we have been super busy. I know there's been a coronavirus, there's been lockdowns, there's been all kinds of other things. I was expecting I'd be doing a whole bunch more traveling. I think a lot of other people probably were as well. Um, but yeah, just in terms of, you know, the, the features that we brought to market, and these are just the, the headlines as well. Uh, this should give you some ideas to how quickly we're bringing new features out. So in April, we released a feature called Enterprise Console. And we, this, was, this was a thing 
that we built specifically for larger organizations, um, specifically for one very large customer of ours. Um, and th the problem they had was they were having to deploy many Runecast Analyzer appliances across their environment. And they wanted to have this single overarching view of everything that was going on. At, at that point in time, they had to log into every single one. So Enterprise Console gives you this central management console where you can manage, where, you, where you've got visibility of everything that's going on. We see, we're seeing a lot of uptake there in the managed service provider industry as well. And in fact, I think I think I saw a session earlier where they mentioned uh, one, one of our uh, partners in Australia mentioned that they're using Enterprise Console in exactly that manner. We added the CIS standard for AWS in April. Now, CIS is the Center for Internet Security. They're a really, really great bunch of folks. And you know, when, when people start talking about regulatory compliance, CIS is always a hot ticket. It, they, they take the idea of the ideas of what you have with the VMware hardening guide and they kind of turn it up to 11. So you get some really, really good guidance on how you should be deploying, managing, and securing your environments. And so we're CIS certified for both VMware, for vSphere, sorry, and also for AWS. We're going through that process for Kubernetes right now. So you should see the, uh, the third CIS certification showing up very, very soon. We had full support for vSphere 7 in May. So obviously vSphere 7 came out, we had to run a bunch of tests. And there were, I think there were one or two things that we had to make slight tweaks due to API changes on the vSphere side. Uh, but yeah, so we've had full vSphere 7 support since May. Also in May, we added support for the NIST standard for AWS. So NIST is, is, is a really important standard for in, in the kind of US federal space. So a lot of US federal customers, anyone who's dealing with um, federal customers or interacting with federal customers, uh, they need to be NIST compliant. So we added NIST support for AWS there. And there's a whole bunch of different, stand, different AWS services that we're covering there. I used to be able to memorize them, now there's too many. Um, we added some public APIs for our enterprise console that, that came in June. Uh, and this is because, you know, when you're, when you're managing things at scale, you don't necessarily want to have to go to a, a graphical user interface to manage these things. So we added these, uh, these public APIs. They're all documented in the Swagger interface on the uh, Runecast Analyzer appliance. So that's another cool thing. All of our documentation is built into the appliance. We have been making some changes to the user interface. And also in June, we started, the, the first change that we made was some changes to our hardware compatibility list checks. So we can check your environment against the VMware HCL and make sure that you're running not only, not only physical hardware, but also BIOSes, firmwares, drivers, all of these things that are compliant with the relevant different HCLs on the vSphere side of things. So you, you'll know if, you, if you're running vSAN in your environment, you've got a very, very strict set of guidelines as to what you're, what you're able to use in a production environment, what's been validated. And if you start drifting away from that, that can be really painful. One of the other really cool things we have with the hardware compatibility list, and this is something that we get a lot of really good feedback about, is you know, we, it, not, not only can we, can we help you with problems on a day-to-day -day basis, so business as usual from an HCL perspective, but if you're looking at upgrading, so let's say, for example, vSphere 7 update one is now out. Update one is typically when a lot of enterprises start thinking seriously about, uh, about upgrading. So there's a lot of customers out there who were on 6.5 and vSphere 6.7, and they're now looking at going from those to vSphere 7 update one. Now, checking the hardware against that upstream version that they're looking to upgrade to can be such a pain in the backside. Um, especially when you bear in mind that with vSphere 7, there are no longer any VMK Linux drivers. So a lot of hardware actually fell out of support after 6.7. And so we can help customers to identify where they might have problems. And we can do this across the entire estate. So if they've got 100 vCenter servers, great, you can come to one place and find out where your problems are going to be, what hardware you're going to need to replace, what hardware you can you know, maybe keep, keep in the racks for another year or two, or maybe shove that out to DR. Um, because it's still going to be supported, you just do, need to do a little bit of work with it in terms of firmwares, drivers, BIOS, and etc. Um, we added some performance enhancements in July, so that's nothing too exciting from a, from a front-facing perspective, but we made a lot of performance enhancements so that you get the, that analysis a lot quicker, and that really helps us with scaling as well. Um, in July, there was an update to Visa Stig. So Visa Stig is a standard that's updated quarterly. So we, we are now updating Visa Stig every quarter. So whenever we see a new update to Visa Stig, you get that down as a knowledge definition. 
Those knowledge definitions, by the way, come down um, roughly once a week. So usually they come out on a Tuesday. In the event that there's a higher security thing, something like a VMware security advisory, we push that out of the door very, very quickly. So last two VMSAs, one, we had coverage within 26 hours for our customers. The other one, we had coverage the same working day. I think it was three or four hours after the VMSA was published. So, you know, we work really, really hard to make sure that you've, you've got those coverages and you, you've got the visibility in those problems um, as, soon as, as soon as possible. Also in July, I mean, we've released a lot of new functionality. Uh, also in July, we added support, as I mentioned earlier, for pure storage. So if you've got pure storage in your environment connected to your vSphere hosts, we're automatically going to detect that you've got pure storage there, and we're going to provide you with pure storage's best practices for configuration on vSphere. So this is for um, Flash Array at the moment. Uh, we're looking to add Flash Blade support in the not too distant future. But you know, these are, these are the first of the hardware vendors that we're, you know, we're providing these uh, these kind of insights for. If you'd be interested in your, you know, hardware vendors that you're working with, um, having their best practices available within Runecast Analyzer, please do hit me up after the event or uh, you know, on Twitter or, or, or whatever. And I would be absolutely delighted to, uh, to work with, with, those, with those hardware vendors in, in partnership to, to get you these, these kind of insights. September, so we, we had a few releases in July. We took a little bit of a tiny break and then early in September, we released support for GDPR for AWS. So over in Europe, as I think a whole bunch of the folks here today are, um, you know, GDPR is a hot topic. And, you know, we, we're, we're looking at, yeah, lots, lots and lots of organizations have to legally um, abide by GDPR. So we can help you with, that, with your GDPR compliance for AWS as well. Um, we're, we're almost at the point now where I've, I've run out of new features to talk about. So custom profiles we added in September also. This was our second release in September. Custom profiles allows you to build your own specific set of checks based on the, I think there's 2,800 and something checks built into the appliance today. So we keep adding more checks, but you can select any of those checks and build them into a custom profile, which is, can be really helpful if you need to abide by maybe uh, PCI DSS or maybe you know any of the other standards. Uh, but if you've got extra internal standards that you need to work towards, custom profiles can really help you track your compliance with those standards and the reporting as well. And finally, last one for this list. This has got to be the longest slide I've ever, ever waited on. Uh, but also on this list, we added support for Kubernetes. So this came out again at VMworld. Um, Kubernetes has been a really hot, a really hot topic for a long time with us now. Uh, so we've got customers and they're you know, just like, okay, well, well I, need to, I need to run my, uh, my Kubernetes workloads on OpenShift or on VMware Tanzu or on uh, EKS or GKE or where, wherever you want to run those workloads. It doesn't matter where they run. As long as we can get access to an API server, we can pull back a whole bunch of data for you there and help you with your best practices and your security compliance from a Kubernetes perspective, at the same time as handling all of your vSphere and all of the other good stuff that we do. So with that in mind, this is my favorite meme that I've, I've been able to find in, in a long time. I mean, who doesn't love uh, at the cap wearing a hat, playing the drums? Um, yeah, anyway, so uh, that's, that's, this, is, this is my favorite. I, I should really have had the instant rim shot sound as well, but there we go. So with this in mind, I just really wanted to drill home the fact that Roomcast is an incredibly customer-driven vendor. All of the new features that we bring to market come based on customer feedback. We make changes really, really quickly. We make them very regularly as well. And um, so, you know, just bear that in mind. So with that in mind, this, the, what I'm about to announce to you is one of the most requested standards that we've had in all of my time with the company. Uh, it's also one of the fastest growing information security standards in the world. Uh, so with that in mind, please say a big welcome to ISO 27001. So security standards aren't necessarily the sexiest of things on the planet. But ISO 27001 2013, the most recent version of ISO 27001, is the basis of the information security management system. So there are many, many interpretations of an ISMS out there. Some of them are ISO compliant, some of them are not. Uh, but things that an ISMS can really help you with, they can really help you to uh, reduce costs when it comes to information security. Because instead of applying point products that, that you know, might potentially address a specific issue um, as, as and when you come to them, it really helps you build security into everything that you do. Um, ISO covered people, processes, and technology. Now, clearly, what we're doing as a product, we're scanning your technology. So we're monitoring your, te your, te your technology. 
we can only really help on that side of things. Um, but once you get that side of things done, then the people and processes thing, that can come quite easily afterwards. The technology tends to be the, tends to be the hardest bit to do because it's the most, most fluid. So technology changes very, very regularly. Um, people and processes, not quite so much. So done well, this can really help to improve a company's culture because you're building security in at every step, you know, every step of the way. And when you do this, you don't have to think of, okay, well, we've developed an application and now we need to wrap some security around it. And incidentally, that's the wrong way of doing it anyway. You should be building security in as you develop your applications. But typically, that is not what happens. But you, so you can do things like that. But also even you know, people like, you know, the people manning manage your reception, they're opening emails all the time. If you have this, this kind of culture where security is just embedded, everybody is aware of, of these kind of things, you're going to have less risk of things like, uh, you know, some, some nasty coming in over email, someone's going to open it, and uh, you know, all kinds of bad things happen. So, yeah, culture is a really important thing as well. Um, it provides this central management, central framework for keeping information safe. So, again, you know, all of the stuff that sits in with ISO, ISO is a framework, it's not a strict set of rules. So think about think about it from from the perspective of you know it's, it's kind of a little bit like ISO actually if you think a bit about think about it like that it gives you some really good ideas it gives you you know you should really consider these things whenever you're doing anything with your business so so long as you're considering these things you don't necessarily have to do everything exactly as ISO says but that you should have a really good reason for drifting away from that it can help it increase attack resilience because you know as we as I've already covered. If you have security built in uh, everywhere within your business, um, you're, you're going to be a more resilient organization. It can help you to respond to evolving threats in the same way. And it protects confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. So when we talk about information security, these are the three pillars. Some people call them the, the CIA triad. And if you take away any one of these three pillars, think of it like a three-legged stool. If you take away one of these legs, information security falls over. It's no, it's, it's no use. So if you, if you have confidentiality and integrity, but your data is not available when you need it, then it's not, that, that data is not really any use to you because it's not available. If you have integrity and availability, but it's not confidential, so basically anyone could get access to that data, then again, you don't have information security. Uh, if you've got confidentiality and availability, you know, great. But if someone can tamper with that data, someone can, can mess with your applications, then again, the confidentiality and the availability are largely useless. You need all three of them, and they need to be three strong legs on that stool. It's also about securing information in all forms. So, you know, typically when we when we look at the at info infosec, people think about, oh well, you know, how am I going to encrypt my data in that database? How am I going to be doing things with my file file servers? How how am I handling that thing, those things? But ISO also covers things like. Um, you know, if you've got printed out documentation that's stored in a filing cabinet, that is still subject to ISO. You know, you need, you need to consider all of these things. What happens if your office burns down? All of that data is no longer available. So the CIA stool falls over. How do you handle these things? I'm not sure what this particular image is all about. Um, but I just really liked it. So, um, yeah, this, this, is, this is how I roll, basically. I find, I find images that amuse me and I just have to share them with the world. So what does it mean for me? So ISO includes 114 controls in Annex A. That's 114 separate things that you need to be able to manage or separate things that you need to deal with. Um, it includes things such as physical access control. So physical access control is, is really important because if someone, you know, if, if a malicious actor um, can just tailgate someone into your offices and they can then tailgate into your data center, then you know, there's nothing to stop them going and cutting cables and pulling drives and all kinds of things. So physical access control is one of those things a lot of organizations don't think of because they think, oh, well, I've got firewalls, that's, that's all I need. But the human element is, you know, the, the social element as well is really important. ISO covers all of these things. It covers firewall policies. So in the same way that you need to have physical access control to prevent someone from walking into your data center, you've got to have logical access control as well in forms of firewall policies. Um, and this includes things like not having a, a default any any rule. Um, no, hopefully, hopefully nobody in this session 
is in that situation. But also it involves things like making sure that you're, you're reviewing those rules regularly to make sure that they're still relevant to your organization. It involves security staff awareness. And I, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I've definitely worked in places where there's a, a security team. Um, they're also known as the big red, I said no team, because no matter what you ask them for, they say, no, it's, not, it's, it's, too, it's too risky. And that's not what security is there for. Security there is there as an enabler for the business. If they're not enabling you to do business in a secure and safe fashion, they're not doing their job properly. So, you know, we want to make sure that your security staff are aware of all of these um, new evolving threats, all of these new ways that they need to think about things. And when you start thinking about cloud computing, you know, that there is there is the old guard in security. A lot of them will say, oh, you can't, you just can't put your work, workloads in the cloud because it's, you know, it's someone else's data center. It's not, it's, it's not secure. So, you know, they need to be aware of the controls that you can put in place when you're moving your workloads and you're, you're potentially running them in a cloud operating model. It includes threat monitoring procedures. So things like, you know, okay, great. You've got all these firewall policies. Do you actually have a look and see, you know, where are people trying to get to where and your firewall is blocking them? Are your firewall rules actually doing everything that they need to do? Or do you need to start thinking of other things as well? Do you need to start thinking about maybe, um, I don't know, blocking all traffic from specific geos or there's, there's lots of different ways of looking at it, but also from internally as well. So you've probably got some kind of antivirus that runs on your workstations and the servers, uh, but how often do people actually check what's going on there when it's not just saying, yeah, found a, found a virus, killed it. Incident management processes, they kind of follow on from that. So you need to have a process in place so that if you have a breach, or you know, if you have a loss of availability, how do you handle these things? So incident management is super important. And the last one is encryption. So again, encryption, because it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how good all of the rest of that stuff is. If somebody can gain access to your data um, and it's not in some form of encrypted format, then they've got your data. And then what they're going to do with it. And you know, you want the encryption to happen under your control. So there's there's obviously all the ransomware and things like that doing the rounds as well. And so, you know, you want encryption, but you want to be able to control it. So you need to be able to manage those encryption keys. How do you manage those keys? Where do they live? All of these things, uh, you know, these are things that we should call, that we should consider when we start talking about ISO 27001. Now, I said there's 114, and those are just some very, very, very simple examples as to, you know, the kinds of things that you need to consider. Uh, so one of the other things to bear in mind is that there is also, it's a framework. So any missing controls, you must have those controls or you must have a really, really good reason why you don't need to have those controls. And you may have compensating controls in your environment. So you may have something else in your environment that says, okay, well, you know, maybe, um, so, so a really good example for this is uh, maybe you've got a segregated network and because that network is segregated and you can't actually get to it without being on VPN, and you know, maybe the fact that it's, it's, it's secured in that manner means that you can be a little bit more lax about the services that run on that network. But you need to be able to document this and prove this. So compensating controls are important um, and you, know, we, you need to make sure you have all this stuff documented. Now, I've used this slide a few times in the past and you know, whenever we start talking about compliance, when we, whenever we start talking about audits, this guy re rears his ugly head. I really hate that shirt as well. I love the tie, but I hate the shirt. Um, but yeah, so anyone who's worked in an organization whereby you know you, you have any kind of audit going on, you need to you need to be aware that um, you, you, when, when the audit's going to come round, what's going to happen is this guy's going to rear his ugly head. He's going to appear from some cupboard somewhere, and you basically everyone everyone loses their free time, and also everything else that they're doing from a business as usual perspective, because you must pass that audit. If you don't pass that audit, then the implications are too terrifying to, to even consider. So, you know, what, what we want to do is we want to learn how, how we can avoid this guy, just keeping this covered with his, with his terrible shirt combinations. So with that in mind, um, let's just have a quick look at how Roomcast Analyzer can help you in terms of um, ISO compliance. So, as I said, anyone who's got Roomcast Analyzer deployed right now, so long as you've received the updates, um, you know, you should, you should receive the update by now, but if you're running um, out of band, then you just need to go to the portal, download the latest update, 
Uh, we can come down here if we go to security compliance once we've turned it on. In fact, let me just show you where to turn it on in case you want to check this stuff out. Uh, so you come into settings, go to knowledge profiles. We come down here, we turn on ISO 27001. You'll notice in this environment, I've actually got every single standard turned on. I would urge you not to do that if you like sleeping at night because it's going to find a lot of things if you do that. So we come to security compliance, um, scroll down a little, we can see we have ISO 27001 here. And from a, you know, from, from, from your perspective, the things you need to bear in mind, the, the most important aspect of it for me is that we provide this really easy way to map between the technical findings that Roomcast Analyzer provides you and also these ISO controls. So the ISO controls, as I've highlighted there, these are the things that the auditors are going to be super, super interested in. So they're going to be, you know, someone's going to come to you and say, okay, they're not going to ask you, oh, have you ensured you've got AWS config enabled in all regions? Because from an auditor's perspective, they actually don't care. ISO, as with all the other standards, is written from a non, it's written from a technology agnostic perspective. It needs to know that you're doing the right thing, but it doesn't need to know how you're doing the right thing or how this necessarily needs to apply to your environment. So as with all of our other standards, um, you know, we're going to show you the details here and we can see here's a brief description of what AWS config is and here's what you need to do in order to remediate and then what we're actually going to do, let's just have a quick look at the findings. We can see we only have one object affected, so we have this one AWS account. That's because I've only actually got one AWS account connected in this environment, but you could have many, many, many AWS accounts and a lot of our customers do. Um, so if we look down here, we can see all of these different regions, so US East 1, US West 1, US West 2, etc. AWS Config hasn't been enabled for this account in that region. So we need to go ahead and we need to enable it. So how do we do this? Well, thankfully, Roomcast Analyzer shows you how to do this as well. So you can sign into the AWS console. You can uh, do it all through there. Or alternatively, you can do it with the AWS CLI if you're more about doing things from a command line. And then we finally we provide you with the documentation here as well. And just to give you some indication as to the products that we're covering for ISO. So we have the, the, the kind of standard vSphere, vSAM, NSXV. So our NSX support is, is limited to NSXV right now. However, um, give me about another 15 minutes and I'll talk a little bit more around that. We also have the standard infrastructure as a service kind of, kind of offering. So EC2, IAM, S3, VPC. Those are the four core ones. We cover those pretty much any standard we've got AWS in. But we also have coverage for CloudWatch, RBS, AWS Inspector, EFS. I have to read this out because there's too many for me to memorize. Uh, ECS, CloudTrail Kinesis, AWS Config, and EKS. So if you're running the managed Kubernetes service, great. We can give you the kind of insights from an infrastructure perspective for ISO as well there. So, you know, we've, we've got all this information in here. And that's, that's really good. But maybe, maybe we actually only want to look at specific ISO controls. So we can filter this information that we have. Let's just see how many findings we have. So I've got 253 findings. And you know some of these have got 42, 20. Some of these are impacting on multiple different objects. So we might want to, um, you know, maybe we want to filter this and say, actually, we only want to look at things that come from uh, the control nine group. So what we've got, oh, we've got quite a few in here. I should probably have thought about this before randomly clicking stuff. There we go. So that's everything that comes under ISO control 9.x. Uh, and in, in checking that, we can see we're now down to 96 entries. Um, so if your auditors want to see all of the information that's relevant to those specific controls, great. You can, you can bring them in here. You can show them the Roomcast Analyzer console. Also, you can pick out a report showing you, you know, showing them what, what the findings are that are going to be relevant to those environments. Um, now, because we've got quite a lot of findings, quite a lot of objects affected here, 60, 58, 58, this is just going to take a couple of moments to generate this report. But once this report is generated, you can send that across to your auditors. And, you know, you're going to get all of this information. Um, it, you know, it's going, to, it's going to be with them. And instead of them having to sit over your shoulder every day uh, or all day long, you know, while they, while they check all of these findings, you can just go, okay, great. Here's, here's everything that we've got. Brilliant, there you go. Um, there's a 106 page document. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these findings, but you know, we've got things in here as well. So this isn't just AWS, this is vSphere as well. So we've got things like, we've got SSH running on some hosts. Uh, we've got some parameters on virtual machines that are not in line with the PCI DSS hardening guide, the PCI DSS, with the ISO hardening guide rather. 
So all of that information is in there and you can just show them very, very quickly what's going on. If you just want to get an overview of what's going in, going on there, we can come to the All Issues view and we have this really handy thing that's just about to appear here any second. There we go. So from here, what we can see is, you know, this is looking across all of our different systems. If we want to drill into a specific, maybe we want to look specifically at our vCenter 6.7 environment, um, we can absolutely do this. So yeah, here we go. This is what's gone on in the vCenter environment in the last week or so. We could expand this, you know, if we wanted to make it for the past month, the past year, if that's what we wanted. Uh, but this allows us to see very quickly what's going on. And we can see we've got a lot of a lot of change going on. So as an example here, we've got on the in fact, that's um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. That's 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 somehow in the future, yet in the past. Uh, but at this specific specific scan here, I'm going to have to check NTP in this environment after this session. Uh, so in this one, we've got you know we have a bunch of a bunch of findings, but the next time we come in, we've got a lot more. So maybe the reason that we've found a lot more findings is because we've just introduced something like an ISO 27001 standard. Or maybe we've got someone in our environment who's making changes because they don't necessarily understand what's going on. Um, but with that in mind, we can have a look, we can compare with the previous result and we can see what, what's actually changed. Um, so we can take the relevant action. So as soon as we see that we're starting to drift away from that baseline that we want to work towards, uh, we can make changes. Uh, so that's, that's super important as well. That's probably a good point to break back from the uh, demo because I've just realized we are running out of time rapidly. So um, with that in mind, um, that is not the only thing I've got to show you today. So ISO 27001, is, I'm super, super excited that it's out there. Uh, and by the way, yeah, um, we still don't have any questions in. So if anyone does have any questions, please do, do fill them in. Uh, we've got about another 15 minutes in total, but that's including time for Q&A. Uh, so that is not all. Uh, something else that we've been working on, uh, this was in, in line with some of our customers in the US. So we're working with the US military quite a lot. They have their own specific standard called, um, called the DESA STIGs. Um, the DESA STIGs, they, what, the auditors have this thing called the STIG viewer. So what we were asked to do was produce, a, have, a, you know, have some sort of way of getting the data, the, the insights that we're providing with Roomcast Analyzer. So we're scanning the environment as it is, uh, getting the, that information out of there into a format that the STIG viewer can use. So they can just provide these zip files to uh, their auditors and then the auditors can go, okay, great. I don't even need to come and visit you. So with that in mind, let's just show you very quickly how that works. So um, let me just come off. Let's, let's select a vCenter 6.5 environment. And the reason for this is because Visa STIG only covers up to vSphere 6.5. There isn't a STIG for 6.7 as yet. Um, so if we come in here, go to security compliance. So again, we have STIG turned on and then we have our export capability, and we've just added this extra functionality here to export the STIG checklist. Now, there's a checklist generated for, um, for every single host in the environment. Now, thankfully, these are pretty small environments. So let's see, has that downloaded? That's, where's today? 12.44, that looks like me. So let's just copy that, we'll drop that on our desktop. And then from here, I'm just gonna launch the Stigvio. So Stigvio is an application you can download from the, uh, from the DESA website. It's, it's freely available. Um, dependent on what platform you're on, you may, you may need to install something nasty like Java. Uh, but what we can do is we can go to the checklist and we can open the checklist from a file. And so if I just go to, uh, where did I put it, desktop, I need to do some cleanup here as well. So we can see here, I've got three checklist files. I can open all three checklists. And we can see from here, these are all the problems that we've got. So these are now in a format that they can hand straight across to their auditors. And, you know, hopefully there will be less red and it would all be green. But, you know, these, these are the things, it just allows our customers uh, to work with their auditors rather than against them. So that's that. Um, and, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, we, do have, we do have one more thing that I want to talk to you about. Um, so... We've been, we've been waiting for VMware to release the uh, VMware Security Configuration Guide for vSphere 7. And that was, that was published um, just, um, just over a month ago now. Uh, my ex-colleague, uh, Bob Plankers, has, has, has published this. It's a great document. The Security Configuration Guide has been um, either the bane of your life or a lifesaver, dependent on where you stand on the vSphere security side of things uh, for a long time. But the vSphere 7 Security Configuration Guide for vSphere 7 is now available. And also, you know, from there, 
Um, actually, no, I can't show you this um, in here because I don't have any vSphere 7 in this lab. Um, but yeah, you just, in fact, let's, let's just show you how that would work um, if I did have vSphere 7. So um, again, vSphere, the VMware guidelines, this covers off um, all of the stuff to do with vSphere. This is the vSphere security configuration guide. Um, these are the various different products. So we've got coverage for vSphere and NSXV. Uh, but this vSphere coverage now includes coverage of vSphere 7 as well as 6065 and 67. So, yeah, there, there's not an extra button to go to or anything like that. But if you've got vSphere 7 in your environment, we'll now analyze it against the vSphere 7 security configuration guide. And that is kind of, we're kind of getting towards the, um, the, the, the top of the session now. We've got another 13 minutes. Let's just check. Have we? We have no questions whatsoever, which is either it either means I'm doing a really good job or everyone's fallen asleep. Um, I, I hope it's the former, but you know, if you do have any questions, please do drop them in the chat or the QA. Uh, we'll cover those um, you know, before the end of the session. Uh, so with that in mind, and I did have to check whether I was allowed to talk about any of these things before, before this session. Um, so I have mentioned that we've got coverage for an SXV in the product already coming real soon. And I mean, real soon um, in the coming weeks, we're going to see support for NSXP as well. So if you've got NSXP running in your environment, you'll be able to get the same kind of insight, things like the VMware security configuration guide, um, all of that for VMware NSXT. And obviously NSXP is the future VMware NSXV is kind of, it's, it's, I think it's been, I'm not sure if it's been officially sunset as yet, but my understanding is that there's, um, you know, there's, there's no development efforts going into NSXT. Um, one of the other really cool things about the fact that we're introducing NSXT support is we have, um, we've been having a lot of conversations with uh, VMware cloud provider partners. And, you know, again, we've had a few folks from BCPP partners um, at the beginning of the session, particularly folks in Australia, um, you know, they're, they're, they're using think tools like vCloud Director or VMware Cloud Director as it's now, now called. Um, and NSXT is kind of part of the big integration there. So if you're a service provider, you need to be able to do things like software defined networking. Manually handling networking in a service provider environment is not really feasible. So with that in mind, on top of NSXT, we're also gonna be introducing um, support for VMware Cloud Director um, in, the coming, in the coming month or so. Now this is going to be um, an initial availability. It's gonna be essentially, it's gonna be a beta program. We want to kind of really get that out there and you know get work, work with our partners in the VCPP space and you know get some feedback and from that feedback we can then iterate on and build some extra stuff. Uh, but yeah, so there's going to be functionality in there for VCPP partners as well. So if you're interested in that, um, then you know we can we can absolutely talk offline. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter or whatever, and you know we can have a chat about getting you into that beta program. Um, that's not everything. So as I mentioned already, we've got we've got a really aggressive roadmap. You know, we've we've pushed out all of these new features already this year. Um, we've still got a month and a half to go, really. So um, you know, we're, we're not we're not resting on our laurels. Uh, one of the other things that we've been asked a lot about is um, ServiceNow. So ServiceNow, we've got a whole bunch of customers that are using ServiceNow as their ITSM platform, and those uh, those those customers really want to have this capability. You know, so that when Runecast Analyzer has a finding. It can automatically raise a ticket in service now and you know assign it to the relevant engineering group so that someone can be tasked to remediate these findings so again that's going to be um, an initial availability it's going to be a phase one and then we'll see some extended functionality in the new year as well uh, moving on from that um, one that's probably more most important to the uk uh, but also anyone who's doing business with organizations in the uk that are kind of in the public sector um, so this is another standard that we've been working towards. Uh, this hopefully should land before the end of the year. Um, it's for cyber essentials. So anyone who's working in the UK public sector or with the UK public sector, if you're handling public data, you need to be cyber essentials certified. So this is going to really help those, those organizations. Uh, what else have we got? Oh yeah, what, I've got one more thing that should, again, should land before the end of the year. And one of the things that we do get asked periodically you know, sometimes we do have we do have calls with, uh, with with potential customers, but what they say to us is, "This is cool. I really want it for my AWS environment or for my Kubernetes, but I don't have any vSphere, and I don't really want to go buy some servers and a SAM to run vSphere on." 
in order to be able to, to, to gain these insights. And so with that in mind, um, hopefully by the end of this year, you should be able to deploy Runecast Analyzer from the AWS Marketplace. Um, you know, from the, the AWS Marketplace, obviously you can deploy all kinds of different solutions. So we're, ju we're just kind of going through the certification process that you have to go through to get to that point. And then once that's there, you'll be able to deploy into an Amazon EC2 instance. And you can run and scan your environments from AWS as well. Now, if you're, if you're running a kind of mixed environment, some stuff in AWS, some stuff on premises, you might still want to maintain that footprint on premises because you know, you're going to be pulling a lot of data off your vCenter server and all of those kinds of things. But with Enterprise Console, you can join them together. So you've got that um, single pane of glass view as to what's going on. And that is everything I've got for you um, as things stand. So hopefully that's been helpful to everyone. Um, I know I, I did kind of a tease a little bit about you know, what, what this session was going to be. Um, I didn't want to kind of just give, give everything away up front. Um, but yeah, so if we have any more questions, I've just seen we have a question from Andreas. Um, so uh, Hyper-V support, Andreas is asking when we'll see something for Hyper-V. And that is something, it's, it's, it's something that's, that's on the cards, um, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be in the new year now. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be Q1 or Q2. Um, we do have some other stuff that's, that's going on. Um, but yeah, Hyper-V support is, is one of those things that we're working on. Um, we're also working on support for other public clouds as well. So Azure is obviously uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the hot tickets that we spent. I, I don't know about across multiple geos, but certainly in the UK and in a lot of the mayor regions, especially in the public sector, Microsoft are being very, very, very aggressive. And I mean that in the best possible way. You know, their, their pricing is, is, is amazing. Um, they're really, really competitive against AWS. So they're, they're, they're winning a lot of business. So we, we really want to be able to help customers who are running there as well. But I would imagine that the Hyper-V support will either come at the same time as, as Azure or it will follow um, not too long after that. And uh, Gareth says, I wonder when an ARM edition will come out and run it on a Pi. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Interesting idea. But, and if, if someone was going to ask about, about Raspberry Pis, I knew it was going to be Gareth. So thanks for that question, Gareth. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's all the questions we've had so far. I'm just going to check the other areas. Yeah, that's all we've had. So we do have another um, five-ish minutes. So if anyone has any other questions, please feel free. I'm just going to grab a quick sip of tea. Oh, that's better. It's too warm under these lights. There we go. So um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. Um, but again, if anyone, you know, if, if anyone has any ideas or you know, you, you, you want to, you want to, you know, sound me out about any, anything that you, you're kind of looking to uh, get coverage for or anything like that. Um, if you go to roomcast.com, you can sign up for a free 14 day trial. There's a little button if you look in the top right hand corner of the screen. Uh, so sign up for a 14 day trial, deploy the appliance, see what you think of it. And um, we'd love to hear any of your thoughts. And um, if you want to organize a deep dive, so a proper look into all of the different functionality that we have, I've gone very, very high level for today because there's just so much to cover. But if you want a real deep dive into things like the hardware compatibility list or anything like that, um, with either myself or one of my colleagues, um, email us at innovate at roomcast.com. We'd be delighted to uh, to jump on a call at a time that, that suits you and, and cover all of these things. And you can tweet us at roomcast, uh, sorry, tweet us at, at roomcast, or if you want to get hold of me, I'm at kev underscore johnson. Um, yeah, so please feel free to to reach out in any of those ways. We'd be really, really happy to uh, to hear from you. But if, that's, if there's no more questions, I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. I know in the UK, it's just about lunchtime and I do have another session in 50 minutes. So uh, thanks very much everybody for attending. Hopefully it was helpful. Bye-bye. <laughs>